So I have a question here. How many of you are still listening to that dialed home? Really? Come on. Well, okay, you got a point. Uh, all right, thank you very much. Um, today I'm very excited that we'll be having uh, Dr. Lam here to talk about Google Fiber. And some of you probably know that announcement just came out two days ago on the, um, uh, I have it all, a copy here from the San Jose Mercury News that say ultra fast Google Fiber seeks to expand in nine metro areas including San Jose. Google wants to discuss, yes, applause. Um, Google wants to discuss building and operating optical fiber networks starting as early as next year in Phoenix, Atlanta, Nashville, Salt Lake City, San Antonio, Texas, Charlotte, Portland, along with neighboring towns in those areas. Here in the Silicon Valley, the company is also approaching Palo Alto, Mountain View, Sun Sunnyvale, and Santa Clara. So, you know, Pleasanton and uh, San Ramon, you might want to petition a little bit more. Uh, so, along with that announcement, uh, another aspect that I thought was interesting is, uh, in addition to the internet service, Google negotiated licensing rights to offer a package of cable television channels to fiber subscribers, priced competitively with cable company offerings. Now, I don't know if you also heard, the two largest cable operators are in the middle of a um, merging acquisitions, right? Time Warner and Comcast. So this topic, it's quite timely and exciting. So let me uh, introduce you, uh, Dr. Lam, for a little bit. Give the audience a background about you. Uh, Dr. Lam is a currently a technical lead manager at Google, specifically around Google Fiber. Before joining Google, he worked at OpVista Inc. as a chief system architect responsible for the development of an ultra-dense WDM transport system with integrated ROM functionality. Prior to OpVista, Dr. Nam was senior technical staff members at AT&T Labs Research. His research covers broadband optical transport and access networks architectures, optical signal modulation and transmission, passive optical network, HFC, et cetera. His current focus is in optical networking technologies for data center applications and fiber to home. And one other thing after I uh, got to meet Dr. Lam a little bit is uh, he's actually from my hometown, Hong Kong. Uh, he got his engineering degree in electrical engineering from University of Hong Kong with first class honors and PhD in electrical engineering from UCLA. So our talk today will be in Cantonese. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lam. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you, Ivy, for the kind in the introduction. And uh, <clears throat> instead of doing the talk in Cantonese, I can do it in Mandarin, too, so that I can please my girlfriend who's sitting down here from Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the talk today is uh, entitled Towards One Gigabit Per, cent, uh, one gigabit per Second Broadband Access. Here's the outline of the talk. In the introduction section, I'm going to talk about content-driven internet transformation and drivers for wireline broadband access network bandwidth. And the reason that I talk about wireline broadband access is because I work on fiber optic technologies, so I don't do uh, wireless stuff uh, in most of my life. Uh, although this can actually get you bandwidth to wireless base stations, and which we will talk a little bit in the um, following slides. Then I'm going to um, talk about optical fiber in telecommunications because I think not everybody here has the background in um, telecommunications and optical fiber. So um, I know that you guys come with various backgrounds. Uh, then I'm going to talk about Google Fiber Project. Instead of talking um, about the details, the technical details, I'm going to talk about the history, the background, and the status of the uh, Google Fiber Project currently. Uh, at last, I will conclude. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, of content-driven internet transformation. This is a diagram that shows the internet architecture from 1995 to 2007. And this is the internet that you learned from textbooks. What you can see here is a hierarchical network. And on top of this hierarchy is the national backbone operators or national backbone networks operated by companies such as Verizon, AT&T, China Telecom, etc. And then the uh, Regional access providers are connected to the uh, national backbones through the uh, uh, NAP, and um, uh, network access points. 
and which in turn are connected to the next level, the local access providers, um, which are the ISPs. Users are directly connected to the ISPs when they try to access the internet. So if one user on one end of the network wants to communicate with another user, then it needs to go through, the signal needs to go through this hierarchy of networks. And what you see here in this diagram is what the internet is like today. And instead of uh, seeing a hierarchical network, what you see here is a mesh network. And in the center of the mesh is these hyper-content giant uh, provide, uh, uh, hyper-content giants providers uh, such as Google, Amazon, um, Comcast. Uh, and these uh, providers are directly connected to the national backbone providers and also to the ISPs through internet exchange points. Users can be connected to either through the uh, traditional service providers to ISPs or directly to the content providers. What you can see here is a commoditization of IP hosting and also content distribution network. And also the network is shifting from the emphasis on connectivity to emphasis on contents. So if we look at the uh, two tables here, on the left we're showing the uh, top 10 internet bandwidth providers in 2009. And this was a research done by Atlas, uh, top 10 internet service providers. What you see here, um, in 2007, the top 10 bandwidth providers are all national backbone providers. Whereas in 2009, two years later, Google and Comcast actually ranked number three and number six as the top 10 internet service providers. And we can see here the transition from focus on connectivity to focus on content. And also new technologies are reshaping the definition of network. These technologies are, for example, web applications, cloud computing, and content distribution networks. Now, moving forward by one year from 2009 to 2010, this is still the Atlas uh, Internet Bandwidth Provider uh, chart. And according to that report, if Google were an ISP, it would rank as the second largest carrier on the planet. And bear in mind, this is only the visible foreground traffic only. Because in order to operate this network, Google actually has a private backbone network, which is much larger in capacity by orders of magnitude than this uh, uh, front end network that is visible to the public. Here's a chart of some popular networking, uh, network computing applications from the traditional search, e-commerce, um, to social, mobile, maps, um, office documents such as Google Docs. Everything here is accomplished in, accomplished in the network, and also all the services are pretty much provided free of charge. So what you can see here, a uh, cost-effective and reliable infrastructure is needed in order to offer these services online. So this is what we call warehouse-scale computers. What is a warehouse-scale computer? A warehouse scale computer is a large computing facility, utility computing facility that provided um, consolidated computing through many different user interfaces, many applications at many different locations. Here's a graph of the uh, mega scale data center that uh, uh, one of Google's mega uh, scale data center, uh, and you can see warehouse. This is this looks like a big warehouse with servers and also uh, networking ma machines uh, installed on racks. What are the benefits uh, from, uh, uh, from warehouse scale computing? First is scale. You don't need to worry about um, running, scaling your network, your computing facility. So there's unlimited uh, uh, CPUs, memory, hard disks that you can use. And also you get ubiquitous data availability over the network. As long as you have access to the network, you have access to your data and you don't need to worry about carrying data around. And then you get automatic ba backup, so which offers you data safety. You don't need to worry about your hard disk crash or you losing that data. It also offers you a good platform for collaboration because as soon as you can get onto the network and you can share documents and you can, you can several people can work at the same time simultaneously on the same document. So at Google, very few people use Microsoft Office, not that we're against Microsoft, but really because it's much more conven convenient to collaborate if we use Google Doc to, um, to edit uh, um, the, to, or to share the documents. And it also provides you cost savings because you don't have to maintain your own computing facilities. Everything is offered through this utility computing. For the operator like Google, 
we get high utilization of uh, the infrastructure through technologies such as virt virtualization. So here are some scale challenges uh, that you have to overcome before you can actually offer such services. This is uh, obviously a Google perspective. In terms of user space, our world has about 7.1 billion people. This is a June 13 uh, World uh, Meters uh, um, 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 uh, research uh, or census data. There are about 2.5 billion internet users, which is about 20% of the world uh, population. Google search reaches over a billion users per day, and my data is actually slightly uh, old. So Android, on Android OS, we get more than 900 million activated users. Um, I think today is probably uh, over a billion already. In terms of geographical distribution, Google search is delivered globally over 180, uh, 181 countries in, di in 146 different languages. Now let, let, let us look at data growth. The web expands with billions of new pages every month. And every four hours, we crawl or refresh more contents than the whole Library of con uh, Congress. We have to crawl these contents and save them in our data center in order to offer the search services. Now YouTube, as I'm speaking now, is gaining over more than 100 hours of video every minute. And a lot of these are in high definition these days. Here's a picture showing you data center scaling in the last uh, 15 years. We can see the uh, first generation server rack in 1999, which looks very crude. 2001, these servers are moving into high efficient um, data centers. And on the top right hand, right hand side corner, this is the Dell's uh, Oregon data center that Google operates. On the bottom, you see this uh, international backbone and uh, network uh, which is Google's uh, software-defined uh, WAN network, uh, wide area network. And you see a lot of undersea cables cross uh, the oceans, trans-Pacific and trans-Atlantic cables, in addition to terrest terrestrial cab uh, cables on the continent of the US and, and, and Europe, as well as Asia. So you can see here we, we operate a massive network here in order to operate our data center. Now let me look at some of the drivers for wireline access bandwidth. Even though our economy has been suffering um, some, somewhat in the last few years, the global internet traffic is still growing at 34 to 50% year-over-year rate, depending on what, uh, sense, uh, what, what uh, survey data that you're looking at. If you look at um, the network architecture, this is a gener generic IP network architecture, and in the center you have the data centers and which have the servers offering the contents and services. And the data centers are connected to the internet backbones through gateways. And the internet backbones are connected to regional area networks. All this network uh, in the backbone and also in the uh, regional uh, areas are all supported, uh, these days are all run on fiber optic uh, facilities or fiber optic technologies. So fiber is everywhere in our communication network. The uh, Last mile, which is the access network, is where there are a lot of different technologies, such as DSL, which is the traditional phone line, uh, your cable modem, which is very popular in North America, and also fiber to the home, which is what, the, what I'm working on currently. So <clears throat> we can see in the last few years, content distribution network is getting more and more popular. And the contents are actually moving away from the center of the network to the edge of the network. So we have um, more and more content edge servers which are distributed at the edge of the network. And such a transformation helps to reduce the latency of the service and also improve uh, user experiences because the delay from the users to the contents is, is reduced when you actually move the service to the edge of the network. Another benefit of this movement is that we reduce the long haul backbone bandwidth requirements and we also reduce the cost of long haul backbone network which is very expensive to deploy and also very expensive to run. Such widespread uh, deployment of uh, content distribution network, or CDN, certainly put a lot of stresses on access network bandwidth because you have so much bond content to push to the end users and you need a lot of access bandwidth in order to access the content. Here's another trend in, uh, uh, in the entertainment industry which drives the uh, 
bandwidth uh, uh, um, demand. So TVs or uh, uh, video is moving away from broadcast, uh, traditional broadcast architecture where you have a head end and the same copy of content is broadcast to individual users. This is the so-called traditional linear broadcast TV. It's very bandwidth efficient because the same copy of the signal is sent to all the users. However, today, we can see here YouTube, Hulu, Netflix, these, are, these so called over the top services are getting very, very popular because users can get any content, content anytime and from anywhere. Because these users are accessing the contents at different uh, uh, time and also different locations. So you can't use the broadcast uh, uh, services anymore and each user needs to get his own uh, unicast copy. Uh, a lot of times in a single household, you have multiple users accessing different contents um, on different terminals, your tablet, your cell phone, your, uh, uh, your uh, intelligent or uh, uh, TVs. So all these will drive the bandwidth demand inside user homes. Here are some YouTube statistics. There are more than a billion unique users visiting YouTube each month. You can actually see all these data online from Google's uh, website. And over 6 billion hours of videos are watched every month on YouTube. That is almost one hour per person on, on the Earth. So I said there's about 7.1 billion uh, world population now, right? And China accounts for 1.3 billion. So YouTube doesn't access China. So you can see here, everybody else outside China, there's one hour of uh, <laughs> YouTube service <laughs> for, for every person on the Earth. And we have 100 hours of videos uploaded to YouTube every minute, as I mentioned earlier. 70% of the YouTube traffic actually comes from outside the US. And YouTube is localized in 56 different countries across 61 different languages. According to Nielsen, which is a market research company, YouTube reaches more US adults aged from 18 to 34 years old than any cable network. So if we look at our uh, um, our, 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 our living room at home. The TVs are moving from analog to digital, standard definition to high definition to intelligent IPTV, super high definition 4K, and also three-dimensional. So all these changes require more and more bandwidth. Let's look at the bandwidth requirement for um, high definition streaming. For an ultra high definition or 4K TV, which gives you 3008 840 times 2,160 pixels resolution. You need more than 20 megabit per second of bandwidth with the latest uh, video compression technology, which is H.265. And if you want to do 3D um, streaming, you need two times the bandwidth. You need twice the bandwidth. The next generation is the super high definition TV, which runs at 4,320 times 7,680 pixels and 22.2 .2 surround sound. After compression, the video alone will require 280 megabit per second. The total rate, data rate of video plus voice uh, will give you 350 megabit per second. You can see here, one gigabit per second bandwidth demand is not out of the, uh, the space. There are actually needs for that. Another thing that we notice, streaming applications require large bandwidth with long holding time. Unlike the traditional web surfing, you click on a web page, you stare at the web page for a few seconds, then you click on another, on a, another, another link. And this video application actually requires that sustaining bandwidth, and there's very little you can do with statistical multiplexing. So you need sustainable bandwidth. The web, gaming, and entertainment industry are also merging. Uh, even at Google uh, Fiber here, we're actually delivering both uh, the uh, TV service, as Ivy mentioned earlier, the, uh, the cable TV service, the lineup, with data services um, on the same platform. And here's another application for high definition or for high bandwidth uh, requirement. These highly immersive uh, uh, high definition telepresence will require a lot of bandwidth. The streaming video only demands downstream bandwidth, but this one actually requires both downstream and upstream bandwidth. Telemedicine and teleconsulting, et cetera, also requires the upstream bandwidth. And also high definition upstream bandwidth is needed if, in order to uh, offer these services effectively. The proliferation of mobile uh, devices these days, mo uh, in 
um, smartphones and also tablet service uh, devices are very popular, and these devices also requires a lot of bandwidth to support. We need a lot of bandwidth to do fiber backhauling of the uh, uh, wireless base stations. In order to have uh, high bandwidth to, to your mobile terminals, the base stations are shrink, shrinking in size, and you need a lot of uh, fiber to actually backhaul these uh, base station antennas uh, to, the, uh, um, um, to, to the back end. Here's a, um, an FCC report published in 2010. The mobile data traffic actu actually grows at 85 to 115% annually, which is much higher than the internet traffic. Mm -hmm. So we need a lot of bandwidth to support, and these bandwidth is not just wireless bandwidth. If you look at wireless technology, from, gen uh, uh, from generation 2.5 to 4G, the bandwidth it can, keeps increasing, and the downstream and ban uh, upstream bandwidth are also going to one gigabit uh, 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 bandwidth with the latest 4G technology such as LTE. So to support these kind of uh, wireless services, uh, operators are also shrinking the, uh, the, the cell sizes, and femtocells um, are getting more and more popular. These days, operators are deploying femtocells even into customers' homes, so you need a lot of backhaul bandwidth to support uh, these operations. So I was talking to some uh, uh, wireless uh, system vendors, and I was asking, asking them what the, the, the uh, small cell radius are. And they were telling me that with the latest technology, the small cell radius shrink to 200 to 300 meters. And you can see here we need a lot of low cost fiber infrastructure in order to just to cover um, the needs for small cells. Do you guys have any questions so far? OK, now the next topic I want to talk about is fiber optics in communications. So optical fiber was actually invented uh, uh, by Charles Cow uh, in the 1960s. And Charles actually received the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics in 2009. Unfortunately, he's uh, suffering from Alzheimer's. I think he's still alive today. And these glass fibers are made of pure glass, which is silicon dioxide, which is the same as sand. So they are very cheap uh, and very low cost compared to copper wires, which are scarce. Um, and these fibers, as I mentioned earlier, are deployed ubiquitous in telecommunication systems and also really enable the internet. So here are some of the properties of fibers. In telecommunications, doing uh, wavelength division multiplexing, we use a, a spectrum called the C-band, which offers about 200 terahertz of bandwidth. If you compare that to the coaxial cable at your home, Fiber offers ultra-large bandwidth, and the bandwidth available in fiber compared to coaxial uh, cable is 200,000 times of the usable bandwidth of coaxial cable, which is about uh, 1 gigahertz. Another thing that you notice is uh, C-band is only part, part of the available spectrum of fiber. So this diagram shows you the loss of signal versus wavelength inside fiber. So there's actually a huge spectrum that you can use inside fiber. And the right-hand side shows you the loss of signal uh, inside coaxial cable. And what you can see here, in fiber, we're measuring loss in decibel per kilometer. And you can see here the loss in fiber is only 0.2 decibel per kilometer in C-band. Versus if you look at the coaxial cable loss, we're showing the loss in decibel per 100 feet. So if you look at the signal loss, for coaxial cable, RG6, which is the newest coaxial cable that people uh, offering DTV service, like direct TV service, will install the new cable at your home. This will be RG6. The old cables are RG59, which will be even having worse loss. So if you look at the loss of fiber compared to loss of coaxial cable, fiber has 60 times better loss. In terms of size, an optical fiber has a diameter of 125 micrometer, and this is the core plus the cladding, which is 360, uh, which is 3,600 times smaller than the cross-sectional area of uh, coaxial cable. So you can see here, it's very cost-effective to offer services using fiber rather than coaxial cable. Another thing is fiber transmission is very energy efficient. It takes more than a thousand times of the energy to transmit one bit of informa information wirelessly than on fiber. 
So we're talking about green today and reducing the carbon footprint. So that's why you need this wild network. Don't think that you could do everything in wireless, even though it's very convenient. Another thing is wireless have very limited spectrum, and you can never match that. You cannot even match the spectrum in coaxial cable, not even to say fiber. Another technology which is very important to multiply the capacity of fiber is what we call the wavelength division uh, multiplexing technology. So this is to use multiple colors or multiple wavelengths uh, to, on the same fiber. So you're effectively, effectively multiplexing the fiber capacity by the number of wavelengths or the number of colored light that you put into fiber. And the principle is pretty much like a prism. Then you, you shine white light, and it's disposed, uh, it's dispersed into different colors. So optical fiber is really future proof. And I want to make a pledge here, because this technology was actually pioneered and also championed by my mentor, Dr. Ting Yi Li, who passed away a year ago. The Optical Society is actually setting up a, an innovation award, and we need to raise some fund um, to memorize uh, and to also to honor Ting Yi for his um, luminary vision. So there's a website here, uh, www.osa.org slash Ting Yi Li Fund. So if you can make a pledge there, um, I would highly appreciate it. And also, I think the whole optical fiber communi uh, communication community will appreciate. So here's a progress of optical fiber communications in the last uh, um, 25 years. We can see here, in terms of capacities, in the last 25 years, the capacity in a single fiber, this is in a single fiber, has increased by five orders of magnitude. At the same time, the capacity is increasing. The cost of uh, delivering, per, the cost per bit of delivering service actually is decreasing significantly. So this actually enabled us for all these uh, services and also this cheap bandwidth and available bandwidth gives us the opportunity to offer today's internet service. That's another reason that I was making that pledge, because without these pioneers' work, we wouldn't have today's internet. And this is a diagram showing you the US terrestrial uh, backbone network, all the fibers you can see here in the ground. We have, um, um, we, we have a dense web of fibers operated by these operators. And Google's one of them as well. And here's a map of the undersea optical cable. These are, so I want to actually take a, Take, take, take a survey here. How many people believe that your long distance, long distance communication from the US to Asia uh, goes through satellite communications? One. And how many people believe that uh, it, it takes place in undersea cable? Yes, we use actual undersea cable because satellite doesn't have the, uh, um, the bandwidth. The other thing is satellite delay is very long. So if you use satellite uh, for your long distance call, you will be very annoyed. Next, I want to talk about Google Fiber project. Um, broadband infrastructure is very key to economic growth. Broadband enables people to be connected from everywhere and also reduces traffic jam and greenhouse emission. Uh, I mentioned fiber is very energy efficient. It increases productivity because of closer uh, collaboration that is forged by the network. Um, and I gave the example of Google Doc earlier. And also, broadband creates more opportunity for people because uh, through enhanced information flow. And also, it un uh, unleashes uh, creativity and, and, and also businesses. So in 2009, during the financial crisis, the US government has a uh, uh, stimulus plan. And they set aside $7.2 billion in broadband uh, access to build, uh, to build our actual rural broadband access networks. So at the time when Google's uh, officials heard about this, uh, um, this stimulus plan, they said, OK, why not Google also join the government to advance the com uh, the, uh, our country's uh, broadband communication infrastructure? However, instead of taking money from the government, then Google will fund this project uh, by itself. And access infrastructure build out is very uh, capital intensive. So we want to future proof broadband access infrastructure to ensure continual economic growth. And fiber is the only future-proof broadband access medium, so it's natural to go with fiber. So here's a, um, a, uh, uh, some statistics published by um, ITU, International Telecommunication Union, for the internet users per 100 inhabitants. 
The blue, uh, the blue curve shows the number of internet users per 100 ha inhabitants in developed countries uh, in the last few years, uh, throughout the, uh, um, the years. And the uh, orange curve shows you the number of uh, internet users per 100 inhabitants in underdeveloped uh, or developing world throughout the years. You can see here this gap is widening here, and you can see here um, internet access is really important to in economic growth. And what is the Google Fiber project? Google Fiber project was initially created as a fiber to the home experiment. As I mentioned, uh, Google's uh, uh, officials, uh, company officials, wanted to actually help the companies, uh, the country's infrastructure. So we said, okay, why don't we start an experimental network covering 50,000 to 500,000 households in select cities? And this network will provide sustainable and symmetric one gigabit per second access speed to individual households through optical fiber. The uh, um, initiative was announced in February 2010 through the internet. So we asked individuals and also communities to pledge to join the Google Fiber experiment. And this is a map that shows the cities uh, responding to Google Fiber RFI. This RFI, the request for information, was very successful because more than 1,000 municipalities responded to this online RFI, and also more than 100,000 individuals responded to the online RFI, pledging their community to join Google's effort. So when the uh, company officials saw this, they, they felt, oh, there's real business to be done here, and people really need broadband, and why don't we turn this into a real business? So why do we do this project? This is a chart uh, showing you the um, average advertised broadband download speed of OECD nations. You can see here leading, the leading countries are Japan, Korea, France, um, and US was actually trailing behind all the OECD nations. So this is another reason that we want to actually help the country to move forward with the uh, broadband infrastructure and also to understand next generation broadband access network applications and technologies. Speed does matter. Why does speed matter? We look at FCC, uh, US uh, Federal uh, Com uh, Commission for Communications definition for broadband. Before the Google Fiber project was announced, FCC's definition for broadband was merely 200 kilobit per second, which was really laughable. After July 2010, remember that Google, uh, that Google Fiber was announced in February 2010, FCC revised its definition for, uh, for broadband to two megabits per second downstream and one megabit per second upstream. And how fast is one gigabit per second? What's the concept of one gigabit per second? If you want to download a DVD disc, which is eight gigabyte uh, uh, in volume, with 200 kilobit per second, you need 3.7 days. Even with FCC's revised definition, you still need 4.4 hours. With one gigabit per second, you can accomplish this in one minute. So it really enables a lot of applications. So what are we doing in uh, Google Fiber? W besides providing brand new internet experiences to customers with innovate, uh, innovative broadband access technologies, we're also doing experimenting a lot of uh, new technologies from trenching construction techniques to different op optoelectronics technologies and also network architectures. And also through this um, project, we want to encourage and stimulate innovations in broadband access network applications. So if you ask me what is the compelling application for one gigabit per second, I will tell you that I don't know. But we do believe when you build a network, smart engineers and smart users will come up with applications. So our principle, our philosophy is build it and it will come. Now let us look at uh, Google Fiber Project uh, today. It's a real business to serve people with one gigabit per second ultra high speed connections. And in two December 2010, Google Access Business Unit was formed. March 2011, we announced the first city, which was Kansas City, Kansas. May 2011, we announced the Kansas City's neighbor, Kansas City, Missouri, which is separated from Kansas City, Kansas uh, by a river. In summer 2011, uh, we started Stanford Test Network Testbed. So um, here in the backyard of uh, uh, Palo Alto, we have a testbed um, 
which is uh, offering service to, uh, to the uh, profess Professorville, uh, the uh, faculty residence uh, on Stanford, on Stanford campus. July 2012, uh, the uh, Google Fiber website was launched and we started to uh, allow people to sign up for service. And the, the first customer service was, uh, was lit on in November 2012. In April last year, we announced uh, Austin, Texas, and also Provo, Utah as the next Google Fiber cities. And just uh, about two years ago, as you heard from Ivy, that we announced more cities, and nine metro metropolitans and also 39 different cities. So when Kansas City was announced, Kansas City was the first Google Fiber city. We divided the uh, city into 202 fiber hoods, and each fiber hoods uh, has a community of about, uh, I think, on the order of a thousand users. And we allowed users to actually pledge for the community to sign up for the services in that community. And only when the sign up crosses a certain threshold, then we decide to build in that community. So we're ch just testing out demand. The other thing is, this infrastructure build out is very capital in intensive. So you want to make sure that you build in the areas where there's real demand. So initially, 180 out of the 202 fiber hoods qualify for service. And you can see here's another overwhelming demand for Google Fiber. This is a map uh, of announced Google Fiber cities. The green dots are the cities where we're offering service today. And the, uh, the red dots are the uh, metropolitan areas, which have multiple cities that we are going to build our services. So it's interesting that when Google announced uh, one gigabit per second uh, service in Austin on April 9th, 2013, last year. Uh, Austin is in the backyard of AT&T, um, and because AT&T's headquarters is actually in Texas. AT&T announced uh, the same day that we'll, they will follow the suit to build a one gigabit per second access network. So you can see here, competition is really good for the consumers, and we are not afraid of competitions. So here's a summary of the service plans that we're offering in Kansas City. There are three different service plans. Um, there's a free service plan that you get free internet. This is limited to 500, 5 megabit per second downstream and 1 megabit per second upstream um, speed. And this, is still, this still beats FCC's uh, broadband definition, which is only 4 megabit per second uh, downstream. So if you sign up for this service and pay a $300 construction fee, then you can get the service. Um, the other two premium services that we're offering is a uh, gigabit internet service, which is uh, offered at $70 per month uh, with the construction fee waived. And if you get internet plus TV, then you pay $120 per month. Here's a uh, um, high level view of the Google Fiber Access Network. So we have these uh, fiber huts, which, is, which are the central offices where we run the uh, OLT optical line terminal, which terminates customer traffic. And the huts are connected to the uh, backbone internet. The OLT are connected to end users through the fiber plant. So you can, uh, users are connected to, the, um, to, to Google's network through, uh, through optical fiber. At a user home, customer home, we have these uh, fiber jacks, which are kind of like the modems that you use at home, which terminates optical signals into electrical signals. And then there's a network box, which is really a residential gateway, such a um, kind of like the Linksys box that you run at home, the wireless access point at home, which is connected to a storage box. The storage box is uh, actually offering the DVR function. So if you are getting only the data service, you won't have the storage box. And then there's the TV box, which are the setup boxes, which are connected to your TV. So all the services, including data and also um, digital TV services are offered through the, um, the data network and through our IP network, the high-speed uh, optical IP network. So we are deploying on the road. And one gigabit per second is just the beginning. I think uh, uh, last week, uh, our CFO at uh, some uh, venue, actually, the Google Fiber the access unit uh, actually reports directly to our CFO in, um, as the as the F SVP inside Google. So our CFO at some uh, venue talk about uh, even 10 gigabit per second uh, access. So there are still a lot of uh, R&D work um, to do to improve the current infrastructure and also 
operation efficiency, and also um, we are also working on next generation technologies. Now let me summarize um, with a conclusion. Um, cloud computing and data center networking is really transforming the internet. And new internet applications keeps driving the demand for bandwidth. One gigabit per second access speed is not unimaginable, and it's just the beginning. Fiber optics is the only future-proof medium for broadband communications. And broadband communications is really key to economic development. Deploying the right fiber to the home technology will ensure a continual growth of bandwidth as well as economy. And fiber to the home infrastructure development will stimulate many new innovations and applications as well as economy. Thank you very much.